Hey friends, welcome back to The Daily Dose. We're coming at you with day number 109 today. We are moving right along as we go through the scriptures. Amen? So today, we have got a new book of the Bible. Now, let me pause for just a moment. The book that we're going to start is Isaiah. Now, if you're reading your Bible, you will recall that we were just in 2 Kings, right? Now, from the time that we started the Bible, you know, Genesis, Exodus, so on and so forth, we've been going in chronological order of the books in the way that they are laid out in the Bible, okay? Now, you might say to yourself, did I miss a few days? What's going on here? Because in my Bible, after the book of Kings, what comes next? Right after the book of Kings is the book of First Chronicles, right? So I wondered myself, why are we in Isaiah? We just skipped Chronicles and some other stuff. We're kind of going out of order here. I think that one of the things that this Bible reading plan is doing is trying to go through the books in the Bible in more of a chronological order of which the events they talk about unfold, possibly. So in any case, you're not crazy if you think that you've missed a few days or more because you're like, what happened to Chronicles? We'll get there. It's coming up later, but we're jumping to Isaiah first. So like I said, we are starting Isaiah today. It's a new book. And you know what that normally means. That normally means we have got a video from our friends at Read Scripture, also known as The Bible Project. You can find a link to that down below. They have a great little introductory animated summary video that will help you get a feel for the lay of the land and what we're going to be looking at and talking about as we go through Isaiah. Isaiah is a prophetic book. It speaks of prophecy. It speaks of future events. It spoke of events that were in Isaiah's in the near future, as far as Isaiah's time was concerned. But I believe that it also foreshadows, talks about, and predicts events that have yet to happen. Um, Things that will happen depending on your point of view of the end times. Things that will happen in the millennial kingdom. Things that will happen in regards to the tribulation. um, All kinds of interesting stuff. Also, be warned that the book is very poetic. So it's not told in so much of a um, a narrative story form, you know, like the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis and, and Exodus, it's like, okay, well, this guy met this chick, they had a kid, and then, you know, the kid went off and did this, and then this person did that, and, and so on and so forth. There's a lot of imagery and picturesque verbiage in this book. And, um, well, anyways, you'll see as we get into it. So today we are looking at chapter 1 through chapter 4, and then we've got Psalm number 109. So without further ado, let's jump in and take a quick look. So at the very beginning, we start out with a section that talks about Israel being a rebellious nation. One of the first things that is said is how the nation has fallen so far since the time that David was king. Okay, David was upright for the most part. He had his sins. He had his problems. He had to repent of a number of things. But all in all, his heart was in the right place. He was a man after God's own heart. Okay, And all in all, aside from some errors, in the grand scheme of things, he led the nation um, well in, in a relatively righteous manner. And so we read that, that from where the nation started under David to where it has now come, um, it, it's fallen to great depths. And God is basically declaring and predicting judgment upon the nation because of all the wickedness that is going on and has gone on, okay? Then we go into a section that talks about this thing called the mountain of the Lord. And this is also a prophecy of, um, it's up for discussion, but I believe it's a prophecy of the future, of the end times. Um, it, it, this mountain of the Lord, we're, we're told that all the nations will stream to it and that there will be peace and righteousness and justice. And, and in a sense, you know, you could say, well, maybe Jesus is what this mountain of the Lord is referring to because um, all nations <clears throat> have been invited, us, people from all over the world, have been invited to stream to Jesus to accept what he did on the cross, to believe and and to repent, right? And that there will be peace and righteousness and justice, um, in a sense. But I think that this is looking further into the future, 
right? When there will be ultimate peace and justice. Then we talk about the day of the Lord. Normally, when someone refers to the day of the Lord in Scripture, um, to my understanding, they're usually talking about like a, not necessarily a specific day, um, but sometimes, sometimes a day or time period of judgment, and oftentimes it refers to um, to the tribulation time period, as I understand it. So it, it's kind of a point in time when when all things will be set right, and the enemies of God will be sentenced to condemnation is normally the connotation that most scholars associate with the day of the Lord. Sometimes it's referred to as that day, um, a, a day of judgment comes up in the text. There are some predictions and some events are foretold that will unfold in the future. And um, and then we come to, to a verse that says, Stop trusting in mere humans who have but a breath in their nostrils. Why hold them in esteem? Amen? I think that that's very valid. We shouldn't be looking to the advice per se of, of humans, right? We shouldn't be looking for um, the, next, <clears throat> the next cool fad or trend or the next um, leader that we think will rescue our country and save us, the next president or whatever, right? Um, why should we trust in mere humans? Amen? Um, we need to be trusting in God who gives them breath. Then we read a little section about the branch of the Lord, okay? Now, there's again, there's a lot of imagery that's involved, a lot of word pictures, right? Pictures being painted with words as we go through this book. So I would encourage you to go online and Google some commentaries on the scripture that we're reading and see what some of the scholars have to say about the meanings behind this. Now, um, Israel is often called God's vineyard, or vine, especially in the prophetic literature, right? Isaiah, Jeremiah, um, the branch is said to represent everything that is left over after the Lord executes his judgment, okay? Um, but there's more. The branch imagery is also applied to the true king, the true Davidic king, um, the faithful ruler from the tribe of Judah, a.k.a. the Messiah, that pretty much concludes our, our reading, though, um, in summary in Isaiah today. But one thing I wanted to touch on briefly is from the 31st verse of our psalm reading for today. <clears throat> Excuse me. It says, For he stands at the right hand of the needy to save their lives from those who would condemn them. Right? So that's talking about the Lord, I believe. Right? It's talking about Jesus. Jesus stands at the right hand of the needy and he is willing to save their lives from those who would condemn them, okay? And and who who is it that would be condemning them, right? Who is it? Um, we've got a couple of examples in the New Testament where people were trying to condemn a woman who had been accused of adultery, right? And Jesus stood by her, and, um, and, and ultimately he was able to, in that moment, save her life from those who were trying to condemn her. But I, I think that on a bigger scale, um, it's, it's the evil one. It's the enemy. It's the prince of this world that tries to condemn us and tries to bring charges against us, right? And, and for, for those of us who trust in Jesus, who believe in Jesus, who repent of our sins, as we're told to do in the New Testament by Jesus, for those of us who are in Christ, um, and we recognize that we're needy, we have Jesus at our right hand. And he will save us from the ultimate one who would try to condemn us. So go about your days, my friends, and be encouraged that if you are a believer in the Lord, if you trust in the work that Jesus did on the cross to save you from your sins, that the Lord is essentially at your right hand, and he is going to save you from ultimate condemnation. And that's good news. So that's all I got for you today, friends. So until we meet again, 
Deuces.